Dreams are extremely important. You can't do it unless you imagine it. That is a quote by George Lucas. Welcome to Trina Talk. This is the podcast where guests share their stories of pursuing their passions, living a fulfilled life, and empowering others. Each week, I talk with inspiring leaders, business owners, and people with amazing stories from around the world in unscripted conversations as they share their successes and failures. This podcast is all about empowering you to keep striving in your personal and professional life. I am your host, Trina L. Martin. Hello. The topic of this week's episode is career toolkit. My guest this week is Mark Hirschberg. Mark is the author of the career toolbook, Essential Skills for Success That No One Taught You. Educated at MIT, Mark has spent his career launching and fixing new ventures at startups, Fortune 500s, and academia. He's developed new software languages, online marketplaces, new authentication systems, and tracked criminals and terrorists on the dark web. Mark helped create the Undergraduate Practice Opportunities Program, MIT's Career Success Accelerator, where he's taught for 20 years. Mark also serves on the board of nonprofits Techie Youth and Plant a Million Corals. Hi, Mark. Welcome to Trina Talk. Hi, Trina. Thanks for having me on the show today. Thank you for being on the show. I mean, I, I, I'm reading your bio, and I, I think we are kindred spirits because I think you are a techie like me. Uh, <laughs> and how we start off the show is I always ask my guests to tell the listeners who you are and how you come to be the mark that you are today. I've had a number of things in my life all come together. When I first graduated MIT back in the 90s of the dot-com era, and I started off as a software developer, I realized I wanted to become a leader, an executive. But to do so, it wasn't just about being really good at technology. Yes, I had to understand that. But there were these other skills, leadership, communication, negotiation, building a strong network, all these other skills that were important, but no one bothered to teach me. And that began my journey where I realized I had to teach myself. So I found resources, I began to learn, and I realized these skills aren't just for executives, they're for all of us. So I wanted to hire people with the skills, but they didn't exist either because other people also <laughs> aren't taught the skills. I had to put together my own training programs. And so in parallel to my career where I have built startup companies, I've helped Fortune 500s play startup, I've done a whole bunch of classic tech startup. I've also spent the past 20 years teaching at MIT's Career Success Accelerator, where we're teaching our students how to apply these skills right as an undergrad, and they begin their careers hitting the ground running. These skills are universal, and so I turned it into a book that just came out earlier this year. Wow. And tell, tell the listeners, what's the title of your book? It's called The Career Toolkit, Essential Skills for Success That No One Taught You. It's also an app. I'm laughing because I graduated in the 90s, uh, 94, actually, um, with a computer science degree, dot com era, like you're saying, and you're right. So there are um, soft skills, I would imagine that's what you're talking about, soft skills just in general that you need to know. And I know, and you probably know as well, that there's people in the tech industry that, you know, just... <laughs> They don't have those soft skills. So uh, tell the listeners um, what you saw besides, you know, you having that yearning and desire to be in leadership and executive management where you were like, ooh, I need to learn some other things. Tell, tell the listeners exactly what you saw where you figured, you know what, this is a gap that I need to fill. Well, here's how I look at it. Let's take one particular skill. Let's take negotiations because it illustrates it well. Imagine, for example, you're 25 years old and you get a job for $70,000, but you've learned to negotiate. You just read a book, you took a class. It's not about being the world's best negotiator. We just know a little something. So instead of taking the job for $70,000, 
you go and negotiate and you get 71,000. What happens? Suppose you stay in that job for the next 40 years. That one tiny negotiation just got you $1,000 more for 40 years. That one five minute negotiation just got you $40,000. But of course, you're not going to be in that job for 40 years. You're going to have other jobs, promotions, raises. If you invest the time in learning to negotiate, you're going to be adding tens of thousands, even hundreds of thousands of dollars to your career. But here's the real secret. We can look at negotiations and say, okay, I see how I get more money here and more money in the next job and all adds up. And it's pretty obvious with negotiations. It's not as obvious what's equally true in these other areas with, say, communication. If you just got a little better at communicating, no one's going to say, well, here's $1,000 more, but they're going to say, you're a great communicator. We want you on the team. We want you on this project. You're going to get the promotion. So all of these skills, leading, communicating, team building, building a good network, it's not about being the best in the world. It's about getting just that little bit better. Just spend a little time investing in these skills each year. Read a book, take a class, listen to great podcasts like this one. And as you develop these skills, the incremental returns are going to accumulate over time and give you a massive ROI. And that's really the secret to being successful. Wow. You know, and I'm listening to you because negotiation, that was something that until like I was very senior at the end of my corporate career, I learned how to do. Because you're right, no one t- no one tells you that. You know, I would go in and get jobs, and they were like, "Okay, you here. This is what we're going to pay you." You're like, "Oh, okay," because I was just happy to have a job. When now I know that they have more, and I'm worth more, so to negotiate. And so many people don't know that. That's right. And negotiation. Now we just talked about an example with salary. As you point out, you can get more salary, and we all want that. But there might be other perks. Maybe it's work from home. Maybe it's job opportunities. It might be other things beyond direct compensation. In fact, we negotiate all the time, not just in adversarial way with, okay, I want you to pay me more. You want to pay me less or customers, suppliers. We negotiate with our coworkers all the time. We're negotiating on projects. I don't want to do this hard part. You and your team can do it. Well, you don't want to do it. How do we work that out? We're going to negotiate that. So negotiation not only helps us with that direct, give me more, but it helps in our daily relationships at work and outside of it. Likewise, communication, even leadership. So many people think, well, leadership, that's when I get this title. I'm a manager, director, a VP. That's when I'll lead. But in fact, when we understand leadership, that's something you can do from day one. And if you begin to act as a leader, to be a leader, even if you don't have the title, Companies value that, and that's going to put you on the fast track. So all of these skills really apply much more broadly than we typically think. You know, and that's something, being a retired naval officer, that's something that I have to commend the military for, because at day one, they tell you you're a leader. So they're training you and teaching you to step up and do things as leader. It's not like, oh, I'm enlisted, so I can't do this, or I got to wait until I become an officer. No, you're a leader, regardless of what your position is. And unfortunately, going into corporate, they don't do that. You know, everything is comes with the title and the position. And they think because you may not have that title and position that you don't know how to lead. And that's not always the case. And this is why ex-military are always great hires for corporate America. And I want everyone to replay what you just said, because the military, we think of that as the ultimate positional authority, right? When an officer says, jump, you say, how hot, right? Someone more senior gives you an order, you have to follow it. But even in this very direct command and control hierarchy, the military says, still, you as an individual need to think as a leader. And this is even more true in corporate America, where it's not totally command and control, where they expect you to take that initiative. By doing that, you are going to stand out, help your company, and accelerate your career. And if you are a leader today, make sure the people you are leading understand this. Develop these skills in them because you're going to have a much stronger team when everyone knows how to lead. Mm. So why is it? Because you're instructing now at MIT, right? And you're teaching these principles to undergrads before they actually go out into the world. 
But why is it that we've come this far and, you know, you've recognized this? Why is this something that hasn't been done before? Is it because everybody just had the mindset that, oh, you, you know, you go to school, you get a job and then they'll teach you everything, you know? Well, it's because of what we're trying to do with teaching. If you look at high school in the U.S., high school is a relatively new invention. It only goes back about 100, 150 years because it used to be you learned on the farm. If you were a boy, dad taught you how to farm. If you were a girl, mom taught you how to cook and clean. I know it sounds sexist. That's unfortunately how it was back then. But then we got the Industrial Revolution. You are no longer working on the farm. You're going to the cities. You're working in the factories. Suddenly, you need some additional skills like reading, writing, arithmetic. And so we recognized as a society, we had to train people with these basic skills just to fit into society, to create a good labor force for the growing economy. And that was the purpose of high school, to give you these basic fundamentals. Now, if we look at college, college goes back, the university system, about 900 years. The university system, it's run by professors. And these are wonderful people. I obviously work with them. But professors have a very narrow focus. If you think about your major, maybe it's accounting or marketing or chemistry. What are these professors doing? When you major in marketing, there's a bunch of professors, usually PhDs, who say, we are the marketing experts. We have done deep research. We understand this. And so we have decided, if you want to call yourself a marketer, You need to take these classes. Once you learn this and that and something else, if you take enough classes, learn this set of knowledge, we will designate you a marketer. We'll give you a bachelor's in marketing. All that degree is saying is you have acquired a certain level of knowledge in marketing. They're not saying you're a good marketer or a good employee or that you're someone a company should hire. All that degree says is you have learned this level of information in this discipline. But we've used that as a proxy. And that was fine in the 1950s when you had those rows of people. We've all seen it in Hollywood in the movies. And if you were a marketer, you sat on your little desk and your manager said, Johnson, go work on this marketing campaign. You say, yes, sir. And here's the campaign, sir. What next? And it was very command and control. But in today's world, once we got rid of all those layers of hierarchy during the 70s and 80s, all of a sudden we have these multifunctional teams and the marketer now has to talk to the accountant and the salesperson, the engineer. We have to work together and we have different people. And so far greater set of skills that we need. But universities, because they're pretty old and they move slowly, they're still just teaching you that narrow marketing. I think it's going to be about another 30 years or so before we get widespread adoption of the universities to teach broader skill sets. Really? Wow. So what are you seeing? So you're dealing with students before they really hit the real world, let's say, um, what are you finding that is the biggest thing that they're lacking or the biggest thing that they need to know that as they're approaching graduation and going out into the workforce? Because, I mean, we know negotiation and communication, all of that. We know all of that. But what are some of the, the I guess, the key most critical things that if you could tell them one skill that they should grasp, latch onto, and really master it, what would that be? Peer learning. Because here's the secret to these skills. When we think about marketing or accounting or chemistry, we've all learned some of that or other fields. We've learned in a very knowledge transfer way. The teacher, the professor stands in front of the class and says, Here's a formula to memorize. Here are the three things to know. We get this from books. We get this from podcasts. And that's great. That's a great way to learn knowledge. If you want to learn the periodic table, if you want to learn the four Ps in marketing, great. Go read it. Go memorize it. You've got it. But these skills are more subtle. There are no four Ps to leadership. There is no formula for communication. These are subtle, complex, situational skills. The way we teach at MIT The way they teach at top business schools, it is through peer learning. So what you want to do is you begin your journey to develop these skills. Go get a group of people. Ideally, your company will start supporting it. I've got some free downloads on my website for how they can do that. Or create a local group. Maybe it's a meetup group or some other local community. 
And you say, okay, together we are going to develop our skills in these topics. So you might take a book like mine, and really you can use any other book, again, a great podcast like this one, an article, but you get the whole group to read that content or listen to that content, and then you discuss it. Because it's in that discussion about communication or leadership or any of these other skills that you're going to learn much more subtle points because I don't have the last word on it and how someone else describes it might resonate better with you. So really, as you try to develop these skills, do it as a group. Not only will that hold you more accountable, it's going to give you a richer, deeper experience. Mm. Wow. So I love that. And my thing is, do you go into corporations and teach them this? Because those skills that you're teaching in in college and university, some corporations are really lacking in those areas. And I mean, from from executive on down and some of the people who have been in those corporations for years don't have those skills. Absolutely. In fact, my third chapter is on interviewing. We all think, okay, interviewing, there's lots of stuff on interviewing, right? How do you answer this question that's very hard or tell me about your weaknesses? We don't train people how to hire. And most of us as business owners, as leaders, even just as entry-level employees, we are involved in the hiring process. I have met executives from companies you've heard of. They've been hiring for decades. No one ever taught them how to do it. Are they doing it well? I don't know. No one ever taught me how to cook. I kind of figured it out, but I shouldn't be opening a five-star restaurant. I know that. So these skills, you're right. They're not being taught. Or if they are, they're being taught the wrong way. They say, oh, you three, you're our superstars. We're going to send you to a three-day training class on leadership. So go and take the class. And then what happens? The next week, they're focused on something else. They don't retain it. They don't recall it. That's another great thing about having this peer group is it stays top of mind as you go to it, say, every other week and just spend even 30, 45 minutes on it. To your question, yes, I go into companies. I help them develop these programs. I'll often kick it off with a keynote talk or I do workshops. And we really help create, it's not just my one lecture, my workshop, and now you know it all, but it's really creating this change, kind of teaching a man to fish or teaching a company to fish rather than just handing them a fish. Mm. And when you go in, see, and I'm always curious about this because like you said, there are companies that we all know the names of, but I'm always curious how when you go into these places, they, of course, everyone thinks they're doing it correctly. And you go into these places and you're like, yeah, not so much. How much resistance do you get? Or do you, or you get them saying, well, you know, no, we're fine. We've, we've been successful. You know, the company is X revenue, you know, but so our leadership must be good. Do you get things like that? There's a spectrum. Some (laughs) companies bring me in because they say, we know something is wrong. And that's why you're here and please help us. Others, maybe they had the budget or just thought, oh, here's a well-known speaker. Okay, let's just bring Mark in and we'll check a box and say, look what we did for employee development this quarter. In those companies, they don't necessarily see an issue. And issues, as you point out, are relative. They might be doing well. They're making money. So is there a problem? Not necessarily. Could they do better? Almost guaranteed. And so it's really how you choose to look at. In general, whenever you're trying to create some change, there's always someone who has some incentive to say, I don't want that change. And you have to convince them there's enough extra benefit to overcome that. And it really depends where the company's coming from. But here is a common pattern I see in companies. When you start out, you're doing something. And that something is hopefully working. If it's not, you go out of business. They say, okay, this is working. You keep doing it. But everything is changing around you. Sometimes what's changing is your company itself, the scale. Because if you are trying to get 10 new customers a quarter, that's a very different approach than if you're trying to get 100 or 1,000 a quarter. The number of employees, how you run a company with 40 people is different than how you run it with 400. Even if your company is the same size, same products, same scale, Still, the environment's changing, right? We all know the world changed greatly in the past year. Even without something as dramatic as that, our competitors are evolving, our suppliers, our customers, the ecosystem is always changing. And if we are not paying attention and growing with it, we will get left in the dust. So I think all companies on that front do need to face up to change. 
whether that change has to happen over the next two years or the next 15, that's going to vary by industry. Wow. That is just, it, yeah, it's amazing. And how do, how do these companies come to find you? Do you seek them out? Do they seek you out? How does it happen? So, you know, because of course, n- no one takes action until they just feel like, okay, the, the wheels are falling off here. So we need to get some help. I've been doing consulting for a number of years. And so people had reached out to me through my network, through word of mouth, through my reputation. Now that I have the book out there, a lot more people have heard of me. I'm getting inbound requests on the website. I get to, through speakers bureaus. So people can just reach out directly to the website and I'm happy to have that conversation. Mm, great. Yes. I mean, it's just, <laughs> it's just amazing how, yeah, and it's good. I'm glad you called it toolkit because it is. It's things that we just don't know. And you don't know what you don't know, right? So you you end up taking this journey. And like I said, it, it was me late in my career when I learned that, oh, I can negotiate. And like you said, it's more than just salary. It's, you know, you can negotiate your benefits, your time off, all of these things. But I was never taught that. You know, I was taught, okay, you go get the good job, you know, you do this, you do that. And now I look back and I'm thinking, wow, you know, I could have done X, Y, Z, but I didn't know that. I didn't know that at the time. And so, again, we're not in the 1950s where people are getting one job and staying in that job for 40, 50 years. So if you think about it, every time you move to another job, you have to know how to negotiate and how are you going to do this and and communicate? Um, Because if you have a team or you're going to be in a position where you're um, actually talking to the masses, you, you have to know how to do it, not just talk, but actually communicate and listen. And it's so amazing when I hear people and it's like, okay, you're not listening. You didn't, you didn't hear a word I said, there's a difference between hearing me and listening to me. <laughs> so, so talk about some of those things in, in your work, actually making people see and understand the value of what you're trying to teach them. The key to all of these skills tends to be a perception change. It is not simply, here are the techniques, and I chalk my book full of them. So when we talk about negotiating, there's all sorts of things about how you can do planning, where the stages of negotiations, how to do an opening offer. So there's lots of tactics. But the most important thing that you will get as you read the negotiation chapter is that when you and I are sitting across the table from each other and I'm trying to get a job, so I want more money, more benefits, more things, and you want less because it costs you money, you are not my opposition. We are working together. We are negotiating as a team and together we will hopefully reach an agreement. I need to look at you not as my opponent, but as my partner in this agreement. And when you get that mindset shift, it changes how you approach all your negotiations. Within each of the chapters, it begins with a mindset shift with how you look at doing this. Because I'm not claiming that once you read my book, you know everything you possibly can about this topic. I'm going to get you started. I'm going to point you in the right direction. I'm going to get you that shift that don't just see it's me versus you and let me see how much I can get. It's us together working out a deal that I am definitely going to be happy with or I won't take it. I hope you'll be happy with it. But, well, as long as you take it and I'm happy we've met the goal but it's we as a team and not opposition. And so you get that mindset shift, then you start to get the techniques I talk about in the book, and hopefully you go further in your development and continue to grow those techniques and your experience to do even better with these skills. Oh, that's a good way to look at things. Like you said, the mindset mindset shift and thinking that, okay, we're partners in this. Because a lot of times you do, you go in and it's kind of adversarial, right? You're thinking, okay, I'm going to go in and say this and they're going to try not to give me this. So I need to come back with this. So you're, you're thinking it's a, a tennis game and it's really not. How, how do companies view things like that? Or better yet, I want to have ask you this. So being a veteran and knowing 
other veterans who have left the military and gone into the workforce, um, we're not viewed as assets. Like we were talking earlier, even though we have been taught from day one to be leaders, we have worked with various people, um, a lot of time, um, foreign counterparts. But then when you get into corporate, they dismiss all of that. And I, and me, as well as a lot of my um, peers have left because they go, well, they don't value me. They think I don't bring anything because I haven't been with the company and I didn't go through their program. So they think I'm not qualified. What do you say to businesses like that? And how do you help them to see the value? Yeah, that's a terrible mentality. And just on a personal note, the best salesperson I ever worked with was a former army ranger. Not only do you understand the sales, the how do you create that emotional connection, do the fun stories, make sure the client's happy, but he approached it as you would expect an army ranger to. Everything was planned out in detail. I loved it. I've never met a salesperson as organized, as detailed in planning as this guy. And he was so great to work with. But to your point, companies, when they have that blinder, when they say, well, we're doing well, so why mess with what works? When they have that mentality, that's what gets harder. The companies that grow, the companies that are learning companies always say, you know what? Maybe there is some outside idea. Maybe there's something you can bring to the table. When I consulted to Sears, I was brought in to help launch a labor marketplace that does a lot of business. It, I don't know about today, but as Sears was struggling, it was one of their profitable areas. <laughs> Sears brought me in partially because I have a technology background. I'm going to introduce them to new technology, but also because I would bring in some startup DNA. I'd help Sears be more nimble and act more like a startup and not some hundred plus year old company. So at least in this group, they recognize that. I know Leg Mason, which is a big uh, financial firm, I believe they're a hedge fund, they used to have a reading group. They might still do so. And they would just pick a book and read it and all sorts of different books because that would bring in different ideas and get people to think differently. Sometimes the book, they say, oh, it's interesting, but I don't think it's applicable. Okay, done. Other times they say, oh, that's, that's really fascinating how these animals work in packs or how this system evolved over time. That might help them better evaluate the companies that they're looking at. So really the, the best companies, the one that tends to survive over time, they, are, they know they have to constantly grow and change. And that's by taking in outside ideas. Mm. That's so important because a lot of times you know, we create the cycle of just having internal people. So the same bad behavior is passed on from years to years to years. And then when the outside person comes in, then they're going, oh, don't listen to that person. They don't know what they're talking about. And it's like, well, they do, but you've, you're so used to everyone's used to being in their own little bubble and doing things the same way that they're not open-minded. So that's, um, yeah, that's one of my pet peeves that I've I've found in in this whole journey of life that I've had work, working in corporate. It's just it's very frustrating. There's a reason for this. Let's think about a sports team. So you go and watch a football team, and you go watch them play, and they have a game, and hopefully they do well. Then what happens? You turn off the TV and you're done. But what do they do? They do Monday morning quarterbacking. They analyze the game. They train before their next game. They run drills. They practice. They say, well, here's our next opponent. Let's study what they're doing. Let's figure out our game plan. In the off-season, they're training. We see athletes on the field 100% of our time with them. That's all we go. We don't generally go watch them train, but most of their time is actually spent training, not executing. But what do we do in our jobs? We show up. It's Monday morning. All right, I got to go answer these emails. Now on to the meetings. Now I have to produce this report. It is execute, execute, execute. We don't step back and say, hold on, let me look. Let me, do we need to train? Do we need to think about a new game plan? In fact, a Harvard Business Review article, this is from years ago, said most companies spend less than one day a quarter focusing on their strategy. Mm -hmm. All of us as leaders, whether you're leading a small department or a larger team or entire company, you need to step back from time to time and say, let's review. Let's understand, are we still doing the right things the right way? Get input from everyone. Don't just think this is on you. 
get the whole team to take a little time because as much as you're saying, well, we're burning a, product, a day that could be productive, that could be producing our widgets. If you learn to produce those widgets faster, it's going to pay off in the long run. Mm, so good. So good. Before we go into our questions, I do have one question that I'm curious about and I want to ask you. So you say you've tracked criminals and terrorists on the dark web. Tell me about that. <laughs> My graduate work at MIT was in cybersecurity. And so I've been in and out of that field. Often it's defensive. I've got a number of patents about authentication systems and ways to protect and secure data. For this particular company, we were, let's say, a little more offensive. The criminals are out there, and they're usually operating on the dark web. So we would go out and in a clandestine way do intelligence gathering, because if we can figure out who they are, what they're doing, how they're operating, that information could be shared with Various branches of the government that I'm sure you're familiar with, as well as corporate customers, all of whom are trying to prepare their defenses. So that's what we used to do. And it was certainly a, a very unique uh, type of company and challenge. Mm. So tell the listeners what the dark web is before we go, because I know a lot of people are listening and they're thinking, OK, we're just geek speaking here. So explain to them what the dark web is. The dark web, the technical definition is part of the web that cannot be accessed through conventional tools. Normally we go and use our web browser and we can search and look on websites. Typically the dark web is on Tor, the onion router, which is a special protocol where you can't easily trace back where the servers are, where the people are. And so this is used by bad guys. Why? Well, I think of the dark web like the dark alleys. A dark alley isn't necessarily bad. And you can walk through the dark alley, you can hang out there. But if you're going to do a bad thing, you definitely want to be doing in the dark alley and not the brightly lit street. Likewise, there's plenty of non-bad things happening on the dark web, but people who want to do bad things because it's hard to trace them, it's hard to track them and figure out who they are, they're choosing to do it on the dark web using these technologies. If you're interested, Google Tor, T-O-R, and you can learn more about the Tor project and how this works. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you for explaining that. So we're going to get into our questions. Are you ready? I'm ready. <laughs> Who or what motivates you? Different things, but one of my strong passions is helping people with their professional efficacy, seeing people struggle in their jobs, wanting to contribute more, but unable to. It literally pains me. Mm. So this may ask, be the same thing, but what demotivates you? Working with unethical people. Integrity means so much to me. And when I meet people who just do inappropriate things or don't keep their word, just shuts down any interest. When was a time that something was said or done to hurt you, but it worked out for your good? Oh, that's a, a tough one. Probably some of the women who broke up with me where we were in a fit and maybe I didn't realize it and they did because they probably saved me some time that this wasn't going to work out. Probably many other examples, but that's the first that comes to mind. What is your fear? My fear is that I don't get married and have kids. Is there a time when you wish you had done something that you didn't? So many, many, many times. And that includes taking chances. It includes not following up with people I met. I'll share one brief story. When I finished my master's thesis, I was introduced to Tim Berners-Lee, the guy who invented the World Wide Web. My advisor walked me over, said, Tim, this is my student, Mark. Here's his thesis. It's this really cool topic on voting on the web. You should check it out. And there I was in his office. I'm like, okay, nice to meet you. And I left. I didn't build a relationship with the guy who created the World Wide Web. I have so many stories like that. But each year, I learned to get better. Man. Okay. Is there a time you wish you had not done something? <laughs> there are plenty of times I said something stupid or made a bad choice. I'm not going to go into details. <laughs> We've all done that. Uh, so yes. 
What is your definition of success? For me, success is marriage, children, and a happy family. And then after that, having a successful career and helping others making the world better than when I found it. How do you recharge? It's a combination of things. I am an extrovert introvert. So I do need my downtime. I do need to just be by myself, play games, watch things on TV, recharge. I also go to a event called the Renaissance Weekend Conference, which not Renaissance fairs. I do go to those as well. This is more similar to a TED Talk. And when I go to that, I meet Nobel laureates and professors and Olympians and all these amazing people and learn from them. Now, for an introvert, it can be tiring, but it's also so engaging to meet these fascinating people. Yeah. See, I'm an introvert, extrovert too, so I know how that is. What are you awesome at? Helping people develop their professional skills and also cybersecurity, two different (laughs) areas. What legacy do you want to leave? A wonderful family and making the world better. Give the listeners one motivational takeaway. Remember what we said earlier, that if you can just develop these skills, getting incrementally better, think about just getting 1% better in any of these skills each year, and that's going to have this compounding effect and will accelerate your career faster than you could have imagined. Mark, tell the listeners how they can get your book, if they want to work with you as far as um, having you come in, keynote speak, do workshops, the whole nine yards. You can buy my book anywhere books are sold. Obviously, Amazon. It's also sold in local bookstores, and they can order if they don't have it. It's getting picked up by libraries, so you might be able to find it in your local library. If you want to get in touch with me, you can go to my website, thecareertoolkitbook.com. There you can learn more about the book, including links to where to order it. You can download the app I mentioned. It's a free app on Android and iPhone. You can go to the resources page. And I've got a whole bunch of resources, including how to create these learning groups. And of course, you can get in touch with me if you want to have me come speak at your organization, your company, do a workshop, or just want to reach out and ask me a question. All of this at the website, thecareertoolkitbook.com. Great. Well, Mark, I thank you for being on Trina Talk and sharing your expertise and, and doing what you're doing, because it is definitely a necessary um just feel that we need a field of learning because that is definitely a gap. And I'm glad that you have recognized it and you're helping people. You, But thank you for uh, being on Trina Talk. I really enjoyed our conversation. Thanks for having me. It's been my pleasure. If you like Trina Talk podcast, please don't forget to go out to iTunes and rate it five stars and leave a review. Also, who else in your life do you know that needs some motivation and inspiration in their lives? Don't forget to share Trina Talk with them. I hope you have a great week. And remember, if you change your mindset, you can change your life. Keep striving because success is a journey, not a destination.